well, since we did that equity crowdfunding raise, mm -hmm. I can only reveal information that we've publicly announced. So mm -hmm. I can say that in uh, 2018, we did 8 .8, a little over $8.8 .8 million in sales. Uh, right. 2019, we haven't published that data yet, but let's just say things grew nicely. <laughs> <laughs>
for running, walking, hiking, ultra marathons, working out, doing yoga, you name it. Um, so wow, not even a shoe, cool. just literally the simplest piece of footwear you could make. Protection for your foot, something to hold that onto your foot. Uh, and what happened is people kept telling us, you know, hey, the do-it-yourself kit, I love that, but I don't want to do it myself. So we came up with a ready-to-wear version of the sandal. Hey, that's great, but I don't like how, you know, the sandal has a thing between your toes, even though it doesn't really bother you because the lacing holds around your foot. So we came up with a sport sandal where the webbing goes across your foot. That's great, but what do I do in the winter? Or pardon me, at hiccups, um, or at work when I need shoes. So we made our first casual shoe. Hey, what about a running shoe? We did a running shoe. And everything has really evolved primarily from our customers telling us what they want next after they've had a great experience with our product. Very nice. And uh, th there are like similar ones like in the market, like uh, Vibram. Well, Vibram, um, what mm, all they're doing is the five toe shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. You know, there's one or two, there are a couple other people who were doing like a do-it-yourself kit. One other guy when I first started, uh, and then after I started, a number of people um, some, somehow came up with the same idea. Uh, after <laughs> successful there's one company in fact that their their origin story was you know we tried to find something that you know did what we needed but we couldn't find anything and so we invented this and it's exactly what i was doing three years before <laughs> that so I, I take that as a compliment i don't have a problem with competition um i knew that we could be you know we were offering a better product at a better price and have better marketing so and, but, and yeah. now, now now you've like patented this or it cannot be patented you can only, well, you can't patent a 10,000 year old idea, but what we do have a patent on, we have a number of patents, but one of them is in trying to make the ready to wear version of our sandal where you can just slip this on your foot, you know, mm -hmm. cinch it up and have it fit correctly and hold on nicely. Um, I used to spend, we used to have a house that we were renting that had a hot tub in the backyard and I would spend mm -hmm. many evenings just fantasizing about how to tie knots and how to wrap string around your foot and make it hold up, hold a sandal well. And so this idea, I'm gonna see if you can see it, of having uh -huh. two laces, uh -huh. that then kind of meet at the back at this heel strap. Um, I invented that and we have a patent on that. So it was sort of the first new idea for how to make a sandal that um, adjusts easily, fits properly, feels really comfortable. It was kind of the first new idea in about 5,000 years. And so, uh, and we have a few other patents like on the sole design and design patents on some of our, um, some of our shoes. And so there's a, a bunch of IP, but frankly, you, you can only protect yourself so much. Actually, the best thing I can tell you about protection is just with this pattern. Mm -hmm. We were at a trade show and one of our competitors was there and they had a product that was using a very similar pattern to this. Mm -hmm. And I came up to them and I said, I know you're going to think I'm a horrible human being and I'm just trying to screw you, but it's literally the exact opposite. I'm trying to make it so a federal judge doesn't tell you that you, whether you can stay in business or not. But this product that you have now that you're showing is, is infringing on one of our patents or that, mm -hmm. that's pending. We hadn't gotten the patent yet. And they got really mad at me. It's like, oh, you're saying you invented sandals? I said, no, no, no. I'm just saying that you might want to come over to our booth and take a look and see if you can figure out why I'm telling you that you don't want to come out with that product because uh -huh. it's too close to something we're already doing. Uh -huh. And four days later, the CEO called me and said, uh, my apologies. I want to thank you for doing that because otherwise uh -huh. it would have put us out of business. So there, there's sometimes where have, I mean, that's the best use of a patent is mm -hmm. to save everybody time, effort, and money, not trying to, you know, screw people and put them out of business. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but there's other patents where it's very easy to get around them. So mm -hmm. in footwear patents have a limited, limited use. Cause it's usually pretty easy to find a, a slightly different way to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And so how it like all evolved, like, so you got the initial traction with, how, how did you sell those kits in the first place? That you used Google AdWords? No, I couldn't afford AdWords actually, because <laughs> in the very early days, in two thousand, late two thousand nine, early two thousand ten, when the whole barefoot running thing started to take off, mm -hmm. uh, the, there was big shoe companies that were selling products that they claimed were good for barefoot running, and they didn't care about a return on ad spend. So they were, I mean, the, clicks were like three and four dollars. So at, the, at that time, like ten years ago, yeah. It was crazy. In fact, the thing that I say is, you know, you're in a bad market when um, internet marketers who sell courses on niche marketing are using your market as a thing to go after, because that means that there's people who are spending too much money <laughs> and they're just taking some of that money. And so there was a bunch of courses on how to do niche marketing that were using barefoot running as an example and used me as an example. So, uh, so we couldn't use AdWords at all. I made a bunch of videos early on, just basically how to do everything we did. How, mm -hmm. you know, here's what, here's how our business works. You can co copy the whole thing. I mm -hmm. gave away every secret that we had. 
and I put those on YouTube. I promoted those. There was Google groups was actually popular then. So there were mm-hmm. a couple of groups and I, I participated in those groups to just share valuable information about how to make these products, how to run barefoot, how to run in a minimalist shoe. Uh, and because I was really the only one doing this and treating it like a business uh, and, and creating a bunch of other content as well, PDFs and blog posts and guest posts and articles and you name it. It was just everything I could think of that I could do for free, basically. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And but, so- I, but, I, but, but sorry, I want to interrupt and highlight one thing. The key thing that I was doing was not just creating the content is that mm-hmm. I knew there was an existing group of people who were participating and having a conversation in various places. And I got into that conversation. So it, this wasn't something, again, the original plan was, you know, this wasn't going to be a big business. It was going to be a little hobby, something. And then mm-hmm. it really took off. But what made it work was that there was already a crowd that I could mm-hmm. get involved with and offer something of value. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you would just like start conversations and kind of like help start people them, interrupt them, get involved in them. Um, I, I rarely started them actually. It was mostly just responding to people. And certainly mm-hmm. I had, you know, our website and our, my signature file and I was pointing people to my videos and just throwing in my opinions about things. Um, so it was again, being a part of the community and offering value to the community. Very interesting. And then, uh, so at a certain point you started like with paid advertising, right? Not for quite a long time. Uh, probably mm-hmm. not till maybe, oh gosh, four or five years ago. Not even, maybe not even that. Uh, we ha- I had to wait for the whole thing to die off where there what where people weren't overpaying for the clicks, mm-hmm. and uh, and that and that's really been pretty recent. And the other thing that changed in that time was how Facebook advertising got smarter. Mm-hmm. So like the early days of Facebook advertising, their whole thing with lookalike audiences and custom audiences was really stupid, and it wasn't possible to make money there either. And as that as their algorithm got smarter, as their pixel got smarter, then it became possible to start using Facebook advertising. Uh, so, um, and then uh, the other thing that I did from very early on was I set up an affiliate program and mm-hmm. I gave very good terms to affiliates because I wanted them to be, I wanted them to share in this. And, uh, and with a physical product, it's harder to do really big affiliate commissions because you're, you have higher cost of goods than yeah. obviously the digital product. Um, but I wanted to make it worth their while, so I did. Um, so that was another thing that I did. And um, I don't think, but yeah, paid advertising really kicked in hard for us maybe three years ago. Mm-hmm. Facebook or Google mostly? Both. I mean, we everywhere. Mm-hmm. Cool. And so how like, uh, is that like still performing well for you, the, the paid advertising? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The thing, I'll, I'll give people um, um, something that, I, that I, I realized one day about paid advertising. Mm-hmm. I was working with an agency for Google Shopping, uh, no, for AdWords. Mm-hmm. And one day it hit me and I called them and said, How, are you making any money on non-branded search terms or only on branded search terms? And they said, uh, we're only really making money on the branded search terms. I said, then you're fired. And they were stunned. I said, well, you know, I don't need to pay you for a branded search campaign. So when you're doing search, you want to make sure that you're paying attention to whether it's branded or not branded. Mm-hmm. Basically, whether it's, you know, top of funnel or bottom of funnel, if people already know you versus brand new people, cold traffic versus warm traffic, you need to separate all those out and have different metrics uh, and different goals and different KPIs for each one of those categories. Otherwise, someone will show you a blend in return on your ad spend where you've mm-hmm. got you know, 17 times return on ad spend for the branded and one time for the non-branded and that averages out to you know, six times your, your, uh, your ad spend and you go, wow, that's amazing. And it's like, no, that's not even close to amazing. Um, you're losing money on this chunk. But they go, but you're making money overall. I went, yeah, but I'm losing money here. Mm-hmm. So get rid of that. And there are a lot of agencies or even just people that you'll work with who don't even know to offer that or to, to track that or to pay attention to that. Some of them, they don't know to. Some of them deliberately don't show you that information because they mm-hmm. know that it wouldn't, wouldn't work. Well. They show you like mixed reports with like all kind of, yeah. with, with the whole yeah. com- combined se- segregated data. Yeah. That's interesting. And so, and have you been able to make the, um, the non-branded work? We have, we just can't make it scale as much as I want. So it's mm-hmm. delivering a, po- a return that I like, but I can't turn up the volume as high as I want. Mm-hmm. And Facebook, like how's, how's Facebook performing? Um, Facebook's doing pretty well. I, I'm creating a whole bunch of new types of campaigns that can appeal to a bigger audience. Um, I have a friend who had a product where the entire, the entire targeting that he used was women over 40 in America. 
Mm-hmm. So that's all he needed to do. Mm-hmm. And I, I know with footwear, it's a slightly trickier thing, but you know, everybody wears shoes. So if I can kind of pattern interrupt people and give mm-hmm. them something to think about, some reason to think about their shoes and their feet in a way that they had no reason to a moment ago, uh, then I think I can walk them down the story into why they should take a look at us. And mm-hmm. once I have them on the list, then you know, I think there's some value. Even if they're not buying right away, I've just built up my list significantly. Very interesting. You you get like any like repeat buyers? Oh, a huge amount. Um, we had a we had a big sale at the end of last year, and almost sixty percent of the purchasers were repeat buyers, and many of them had already purchased four or five pairs of our shoes. Very interesting. So so initially, it basically like started as a hobby for you, right? And then kind of like you evolved based on the customer feedback. Is that kind yeah. of the major? Yeah. And how do you get that like customer fee? Just like reading comments? It was, and It was pretty effortless. Um, reviews, comments, emails, phone calls. We, and we, we got, my wife has a great line. She says, you know, with as many shoe companies as there are out there, there's no reason to start another unless your shoes change people's lives. And mm-hmm. doing natural movement, letting your feet do what they're supposed to do, bend and flex and move and feel the world, which mm-hmm. is a little protection. Uh, that's life-changing. You know, if you think about it, if you put your arm in a cast, it comes out weaker and you can't use it. Then you either have to decide, am I going to keep it in a sling and never use it? Or am I going to do some strengthening and use it again? Well, it's the same thing with your foot. If you don't let your foot move, it's like having it in a cast and it gets progressively weaker. So Mm -hmm. if you then take your foot out of that cast and start using it again, same thing, your arm gets stronger, your feet get stronger, and your feet are your foundation. That's every, every movement you make while you're standing. Mm -hmm. based on what your feet do. And it's based on your feet giving information to your brain to tell your rest of your body how to work. So it, we, we get so many, had so many emails and phone calls and reviews from people using the phrase change my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then of course we, we would occasionally do surveys and polls and various things to get Mm -hmm. specific information, but it's the, I mean, I think we have over 20,000 reviews. And so there's a lot of information just in there spontaneously. Very nice. And so how do you like, do you have like multiple avatars or you have like a, like one avatar? That... Um, multiple. Uh, and although I don't pay attention to it a whole lot because even if I, I can break them down, mm-hmm. but there's some things that they have in common uh, still. So they're health and fitness minded men and women within a certain mm-hmm. age range. There's a couple that are older as well. Um, but you know, the majority is in like the 25 to 45 range. Uh, they are slightly overeducated, slightly over income, uh, but again, they're into health and fitness and outdoor activities, most of them. And then there's other ones that we have as well, but for the, the kind of content that we're creating, it, it doesn't have to be as sort of avatar targeted or avatar focused as for certain kinds of brands. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. And do, do you sell mostly in US or like that already? Um, that's evolving very quickly. 80% of our sales used to be in the US and, and Europe is really opening up very fast for us. Mm-hmm. Our wholesale business in Europe is opening up very quickly. Um, and Asia is starting to do the same. So I know over the next 18 months, the, the, uh, the ratio between wholesale and direct and the ratio between US and international is gonna be changing pretty quickly. So, so other, market, other markets will start to get like bigger share? Yeah, but- yeah. Very interesting. You had any like complications with with the virus, like with with this as a brand? Everybody is. Um, you know, some of our factories are back at work with a reduced workforce. Um, uh, we know some people where the factory is back at work, but the suppliers aren't, uh, mm-hmm. or some people where the factories are at work and the suppliers are, but the people who take the product to the ports aren't back. Mm-hmm. So we luckily we ordered a lot of product for the beginning of the year because mm-hmm. we were trying to get some things in before uh, we got hit with additional tariffs. Mm-hmm. And so we have a lot of product for now, but the stuff that we're bringing in for the fall, we're still not sure what's going to happen with the timing on that. So the tariffs, tariffs like they hit, they hit your particular, it's like one of the kind of like segments. Oh yeah, hard. Wow. Was that like be like just increased pricing for the consumer mostly? We couldn't raise prices for the consumer. Um, you know, everybody, basically we couldn't be the first one to jack up prices to cover the cost. And mm-hmm. so um, one situation, we had a big retailer who had placed a big order and then the tariff kicked in uh, and we said, so, you know, can we adjust the price of the order? And they said, no. So wow. uh, we had to, we kind of had to suck it up is the short version. Wow. Uh, challenges, own challenges. <laughs> yeah. Um, this running a business thing, not so simple. <laughs> <laughs>
So, um, I mean, it, it's one of the like most competitive, like when you think about like industries, you have like Adidas, yeah. Nike, you yeah. have like those Ridiculous. huge companies. Like, do you feel like any pressure or is like you totally in different legs? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. We've, um, um, we've definitely been feeling some pressure and I know that the bigger we get, the more it's going to happen. So mm -hmm. this is something that we're, um, I want to say preparing for in different ways. I mean, we're being very, very careful and mm -hmm. we, we've already had a couple of major companies steal some ideas from us or steal some trademarks or copyrighted and material. And mm -hmm. um, we've gone after them and we've prevailed and that cost us a lot of money to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've we've actually taken down a couple of billion dollar companies a couple of times and Fair we've nice. developed <laughs> a bit of a reputation it's like they think we're just going to roll over and i said yeah you're doing the wrong thing i'm not gonna uh, and we're in the right so <laughs> i'm gonna go after this um and it's it's gonna get messy <laughs> that's the simplest thing i can say so the bigger you get, like the bigger, like the more people kind of like, the, the more. Well, I mean, look, we're, we've already seen a couple of things. We've seen some larger companies kind of come towards us mm -hmm. with their designs. One company that we were at a trade show right next to them and their new product was exactly like something we've been selling for four years. And so that was very interesting. Um, and then because we're providing real benefits for people, I mean, mm -hmm. these, these really do something different. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, that's something that other companies can't say. So mm -hmm. Nike, as an example, they have a new shoe that came out and they said, this shoe reduces injuries by 50%. And it did. It reduced injuries by 50% compared to another shoe of theirs that they tested. But when you look at the research, what it showed is that their first shoe, the best-selling motion control shoe they had in a 10-week period during a study that they paid for and that they created, over 30% of the people in that shoe got injured. Wow. And 50, about 15% of the people in the new shoe got injured in a 10-week period. This is hard horrible in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And so if we're having the opposite experience where people are reporting that their injuries are going away and I'm not making medical claims, but mm -hmm. you know, it's a very different thing when, um, when you're reporting how people are getting better versus how few people are getting hurt. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to put some pressure on people. That's, that's interesting. How, how did you get to it? Like, so you, have you always like been like entrepreneur, like, or you had like family of I've, entrepreneurs? I've never, I've, I've never had a job. Um, <laughs> I, uh, unless I, unless I made it for myself basically. Um, and I do come from a family of entrepreneurs. My father was a dentist. He started his own practice. My mm -hmm. mother um, was starting businesses that she ran mostly consulting type businesses and some retail things that she did. Um, my father, my mother's father uh, owned his own store. Um, I think my father's father had an actual job, but I, I can't remember. And because uh, he died when I was very young. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I've all, since the time I was 12, I've always kind of figured out something interesting to do to make money. My sister, when I was, when I was in college, um, maybe I was a junior in college and my sister had, was just starting college and she called uh -huh. me and she said, how much allowance did dad give you when you were a freshman in college? I said, I haven't had an allowance since I was 13. She goes, uh, okay, don't tell them I called. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's interesting and so do you think that that impacted you like and kind of like what do you wanted you know, like probably um i never really thought about it it just never occurred to me not to try and do something on my own i mean i've been doing it since i was 12 it's just finding a way to make money for myself and just by doing something i found that it was enjoyable and then uh -huh. it turned out i could make money by doing it and so I thought about getting a job, but uh, uh, it seemed like, um, I'll, I'll tell the story this way. At one point, I was trying to ask my father for some money to help get something started. And he said to me, uh -huh. why don't you just get a job? And I said, because it wouldn't end well for anybody. And the, the closest thing I ever had to a job, I just realized this, um, there was two summers where I was living in New York City and I was street performing. I did a, an act on the street doing magic uh -huh. and comedy and gymnastics and various things. Uh -huh. uh, and I was bored during the week. So I got a job at a health club because I'd been a gymnast. And so I knew a lot about fitness. And uh -huh. that was the closest thing that I had to a job, but I pretty much could do whatever I wanted there too. So, um, uh, and got yelled at occasionally for doing whatever I wanted. <laughs> but um, but I've never, it, I don't know, it just never occurred to me to, I, I've never had a resume. I've never uh -huh. had a job uh, uh, interview. I've, t I've, I've wanted to go on interviews just to see what it's like. I think it'd be interesting. <laughs> Now you're interviewing people when you're hiring them. I do. And I ask them weird questions. I ask them questions like, give me three reasons why I shouldn't hire you. And if they can't give me real reasons, 
then mm -hmm. I don't hire them. Um, I, I ask them important questions like, what's the latest television show you binge watched and why? Um, mm -hmm. I ask them, um, I, I ask them very odd questions because I'm just trying to get to know who they are. And the other thing I do, I tell them, uh, you know, to get a job here, you have to beat down the door. You have to prove that you want to work here. Mm -hmm. And I thought that if I told people that they would just artificially do it, but they don't. Um, most people just never come back. And then some people just come back. Oh, I had a meeting with a guy yesterday. He's been trying to get a job here for 10 years and the timing was never right. And mm -hmm. I, and now the timing is kind of right. And so we're trying to figure out something to do together. Wow. Very nice. I mean, so, so you're basically giving people a challenge when, when you're hiring them. So you want them to like, it's not, it's not even that I'm giving them the challenge. I'm just, I can't keep a secret. So if I was smart, I wouldn't tell them and I would just wait and see. But mm -hmm. since I can't, I can't keep a secret, I just tell them this is what I want to see. And then I wait and see if I see it. And so this guy, he was just a very expensive marketing person whom I didn't need for a long time. Now we're at the mm -hmm. point where I need some additional people kind of at the management level on the marketing side. Mm -hmm. So it's a relevant conversation, but he's been tracking me. You know, I, I see the guy every year. He tells me what he's doing, who he's working for, what he's learned there. Mm -hmm. He's gotten some great jobs. And, and so um, we're, if people aren't really, really passionate about why we're doing what we're doing, mm -hmm. it's not going to work out. Yeah, yeah, we we found the same thing. We found the same thing. So, what 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 have been like other kind of like so, if you would like, what would you say like to yourself like ten years ago like since you've been running the company? Obviously, you you you've had many challenges. Um, I I can't you know I can't really think of anything to be honest because every decision we made was the best choice that we could think of at that time, uh -huh. and you. Like, look, if somebody was smart when I was 20, they would have said, get a government job with a pension. Uh, and, I, and because there are some interesting government jobs where you work nine to five, you don't work weekends, they give you vacations, you get benefits. And, and I, I don't, even if someone had shown me a really, really great opportunity, mm -hmm. I, I probably wouldn't have taken it, even though they were correct. That's what I should have done. Mm -hmm. um, so being an entrepreneur, you know, there's no guarantees. You might make it, you might not. You might mm -hmm. get a lot of money. You might go bankrupt a number of times. Um, mm -hmm. I have luckily not done that. So uh, it's not for the faint of heart. But mm -hmm. I, so I don't know that I that anyone could have really told me anything um, differently. Like when we first started, you know, barefoot was the idea, and barefoot running was the idea, mm -hmm. and we thought it was going to take over the world, as did a lot of shoe companies who were terrified. And mm -hmm. then some things happened where, you know, they were smart about their PR and changed the way people were thinking. Uh, and I, there's no way I could have predicted that. Um, mm -hmm. So we've been very frugal. We're very, we're, we're very cautious about how we spend money and the return we get on it. Um, so mm -hmm. that's been a good thing. Um, Actually, I've got one idea or one answer to you. So there, every internet marketer that I know has things that they knew they should have done, but they didn't get around to it for some reason. Uh -huh. And if I could tell myself anything, it would be, yeah, just do those things. So as an example, when you go to our website, if uh -huh. you start to, especially if you're doing it on a desktop, not on mobile, if you start to abandon the site, there's a pop-up that shows up that says, would you like to win a hundred dollar? Yeah, zero I got show. it. Yeah, yeah, I just got it. So, um, that generates so many people for our mailing list. It's ridiculous. And I knew about doing that for two years before I did it. And if I had been <laughs> doing it from, if I had been doing it from day one, there'd be another hundred thousand people on my email list right now. Wow. Well, what is the solution you're using for this particular pop-up? Um, I'm using, I'm working with a company called ad shoppers, ADD shoppers. There are a number uh -huh. of other companies you can do it with. Um, Optimunk, just Uno, uh, they were more uh -huh. expensive, so uh, that's why I'm working with ad shoppers. That's wow, and so that is like so. Then you have like the welcome sequence, like welcome emails and stuff, right? Like five, five, seven emails. Yeah. And and and, and a news and actually, here's another thing that I didn't do for years. Um, mm -hmm. We now have a weekly newsletter, and I was very kind of hit and miss about sending out newsletters. Mm -hmm. um, and those newsletters are worth millions of dollars to us. And had mm -hmm. I been doing that sooner, it would have been worth millions of dollars that I passed up on because I just didn't, you know, I, I don't know. I just, first of all, I'd, I thought people would be bothered by sending out a weekly newsletter. We didn't mm -hmm. announce when we changed a weekly. We just started doing it. No opt-outs as a result, you know, no, or nothing more than usual, like mm -hmm. tiny, tiny amount. So I was definitely just passing up or passing on a lot of, uh, a lot of cash by not doing it. Pardon me. Got to make my phone go away. Should have turned that off before. There we go. Um, <laughs> so yeah, 
not doing, not contacting people regularly was a big thing. Um, mm -hmm. Building out the email sequences was a big thing. I, just, I actually started doing that sooner, actually. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I, I, again, I don't know that I could have convinced myself mm -hmm. to do it. But let's just do it this way. I would have started by getting, you know, exit intent sooner, retargeting sooner, ongoing email sooner, bigger mm -hmm. email campaign sooner. Uh, those are kind of the big things. Basically, take advantage of the traffic is what those all, everything that I just uh -huh. mentioned is all about taking advantage of the traffic that I'm already getting. That's, that's interesting. And overall, like, so you, you, you mentioned you started like, yeah, like as inter in like internet entrepreneur in like 1992, you mentioned? 92. Yeah. Wow. How was like, so what, like, what do you see? Like where, where, where it's all going now? Yeah. Well, back in 92, uh, being an internet marketer was easy. Um, you did on page SEO, which was hiding white text with a white background. And then you post a few articles in a few places. I mean, that was it. There was no social media. Um, there was news groups. There was news groups. Um, there was there. There were a few places to, to interact with people. There was you know AOL and CompuServe and Prodigy mm -hmm. and GeoCities, so you could participate in the in, in those places. But there certainly wasn't, um, and there were not a lot of people online, frankly. Mm -hmm. So it was all super easy then. What's what's happened is um, the number of places where people are gathering and that you need to be present uh, or visible has increased dramatically. Mm -hmm. The biggest change that's happened is that the early days of the internet, people were just happy that you could provide a service online. Now they're really demanding and expecting you to do things exactly the way they want it all the time or else. And so everyone expects that you're going to have free unconditional returns, free shipping both ways. If they call and complain, you're going to give them their money back for no good reason. You know, the number of times where someone will call if they're not happy about something, because like, you know, we, with shoes, we say, well, you can, um, if you return them, they have to be in new and unworn condition, which is the same thing that Zappo says is the same thing that Amazon says. Mm -hmm. People don't know that. And then they'll wear them in muddy conditions and then send them back. We don't get a lot of returns, but this will happen sometimes. And mm -hmm. we'll complain. We go, yeah, you know, you wore them outside and they're full of mud. We can't give you a full refund. And they go, well, I'm going to get online and tell people how horrible you are. I go, all right, well, send me a link. I mean, and I'll just post this comment, this conversation or this email thread or recording this conversation. I mean, the, 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 the anonymity of the internet, people have become very emboldened and entitled. Mm -hmm. And it's made customer service, frankly, very, very challenging. Um, people work on the assumption that you're trying to rip them off rather mm -hmm. than be helpful, that there's something, you know, you're trying to screw them in some way instead of the fact that we're all humans and nothing ever works perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, in the early days of the internet, if you replied to an email within 24 hours, the first response you would get back is, I can't believe you replied so quickly. Now we had somebody post like 20 um, reviews to a, of us all over the internet about how horrible our customer service was because they called and they never heard back from us and they emailed and they never heard back from us. They called at three in the morning on a Sunday. I said, well, we weren't at work until six hours later. W what do you expect? Oh, wow. So the expectations is that high? Like, it, again, it's just, a, it's sort of just entitlement. You know what part of it is? Here's the fundamental problem with the internet. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to sum it up right now. Think about this. When you go on a first date with somebody, one of the ways that you bond with that person is by telling stories of problems that you had in previous relationships, mm -hmm. issues that you're having at work. We bond with each other by comparing notes about things that are, that we don't like, that are problematic, that we're complaining, basically mm -hmm. we bond with complaining. Well, the internet and the algorithms on the various social media channels give you bonus points for doing that. If you complain and it gets a lot of response, that tells you, oh, complaining is a good thing. And so complaining and be a, being offended and outraged has, is, gives you bonus points. And so it's just cultivating this whole idea that that's the way to behave, is to be as mad as you can, as fast as you can, as loud as you can, no matter what. And if you're, all, and if you're wrong, you don't <laughs> apologize. You just move on to the next thing. The apologies are disappeared. Like if you look at if you look at comments on Amazon, mm -hmm. here's somebody commenting, and if they're complaining, you can reply and address their complaint. But someone's viewing that, they have to click to read the reply. They don't just see it right away. They see the complaint. Mm -hmm. They don't see the way it was handled, and it might have been handled brilliantly. Yeah. So the interfaces aren't designed to reward people for doing a good job. Um, somebody was just talking about this. Oh, there's a thing I heard on the radio about a. 
a guy who um, was in a coma and they decided to take him off life support. And mm -hmm. so there was this, someone did a post about how, you know, he just died and everybody was commenting about the fact that he just died. Well, it turns out that he didn't actually die. He, they didn't take him off life support and he came out of his coma a couple of weeks later. And the post about, hey, he's not in a coma got buried underneath all the people complaining of, and, and saying all these other things about him being dead. So no one ever saw that he was alive, which is unbelievable. Jeez, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. Like, I mean, yeah, it, like, so when you, when you go on Facebook or like any other platform, you see kind of like the conversation or someone, someone died or someone like the post that naturally get like the most of the engagement are just the ones that you mentioned. Yeah. It, it's very interesting. So how do you like, how do you survive through all of that? <laughs> um, uh, I would say alcohol and heroin, but neither of those are true. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, you know, for me personally, the good news is we have an amazing customer service team and mm -hmm. that's their job. They don't take it as personally as I do. You know, they just, they know that this is how people are. And I mean, we, we've, we've been very lucky and brought in really, really good people who just want to help. Mm -hmm. um, and then every now and then I just run around the room screaming. I mean, sometimes it's just so frustrating. You know, what can you do? We had one, one person who was complaining. He, he posted 200 negative reviews. Wow. about a product that he'd never seen, he'd never worn. He had the only reason he was posting these is he he in fact he sent us an email saying how much he loved what we were doing and loved our products, but mm -hmm. he didn't have the money for it. And we said, "Well, um you can split your payment up into four payments." He goes, "Well, I still don't have the money." Well, we have sales every now and then. If you put yourself on the list, you know, you'll you'll hear about the sale. That's not good enough. And so then he started ranting about how horrible we were and how the product was bad and how I mean just saying all these things that he had no experience of. Mhm. Mm um, and then he started calling me. I called him once, once I saw this was happening and said, you know, it seems like there's a problem. If there's any way I can help, let me know. And mm -hmm. he started calling me 150 times a day wow. and just hanging up or leaving messages where you could just hear him typing or crazy things. Or then he, he got on, um, on one platform, I won't mention it, and, and said, this product is so bad that even people at this store where it was purchased won't take it back even though I have a gift receipt. Well, that's fine except for the fact that store never sold that product. He never had a gift receipt. It was impossible. And when I contacted the platform where he posted this review, they said, well, we think that's a valid review. I said, how can it be a valid review? It's literally not possible. And their answer was, well, why should we believe you? It's like, <laughs> well, you can call the store and ask if they've ever sold our product and they'll tell you no. So, you know, so there's, it's just every now and then, you know, you just mm -hmm. run around screaming about how ridiculous it is. <laughs> So then it's best, it's best to give it to someone else. So you don't take it. Personally. Yeah, for me, for me, because, because I, you know, um, I don't take things personal, personally. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody says, you know, you're an obnoxious, loud, whatever I go, Oh yeah, I, I, I can see that. But <laughs> when it's something where, you know, I'm trying to be helpful uh -huh. and there's a problem, either a real problem or an imaginary problem. I mm -hmm. take that very personally and I want to try and resolve it as quickly as I can. And so sometimes I take it, too personally and it's mm -hmm. better to have somebody else dealing with that instead of me because you know there's other things that i could be doing that are helpful instead of getting upset that someone's upset because the postal service didn't live didn't deliver their package on time and they're mad at me because of it mm -hmm. and Very. by the way notice this is me bonding by complaining <laughs> that's fine i mean you know it's uh you know we all like we, we all like passionate about what we do right like saying that's that's your that's your passion well um, I guess, I, and I guess, look, some of it is that um, this is my way of saying, this is just, again, this is not an easy thing. I have mm -hmm. a friend, I'll tell the story this way. I have a friend who's a nurse and she invented an interesting product and she wants to go into the e-commerce business and sell this product. And I said to her, Here's, here, I just want you to be prepared. That kind of innate empathy that you have for humans that mm -hmm. comes out by the fact that you're a nurse, if you get into the consumer product business, that will go away. <laughs> 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 you know, you might like individuals, but people, not so much. <laughs> that's, that's, it. that's interesting. Um, on Amazon, like what are, what are like, are you doing well on Amazon? Like for like you, you face competition from like, training? um, both we're doing well on Amazon. And what happened on Amazon is like I mentioned before of, you know, that niche market, that niche marketing thing, mm -hmm. um, someone clearly told people on Amazon 
how to, the barefoot running was a thing to go after. And so there are all these Chinese companies that are making shoes that they used to call water shoes that they're now selling as barefoot running shoes for you know a very low price. They're not nearly as good, um, mm-hmm. but they're you know they're they're making two three dollars a pair and they're totally happy doing that. And mm-hmm. so there's competition in that way. And this is a, something that's been going on lately. Um, people have been talking about this quite a bit is Chinese companies or people working with Chinese companies who are just mm-hmm. like kind of lather, rinse and repeat on coming up with either knockoff products or inexpensive versions of those same products uh, and creating companies just you know, like over and over and over. Uh, so they're competing with themselves. They're, mm-hmm. they're in a way that as a real brand, you can't really do. Um, so that put a crimp on things, but you know, we're, we have so many other types of products. It's going quite well. And Amazon Mm -hmm. is continually expanding the ways that you can market on that platform. So that's good. It's also, and we're selling FBA. We don't sell to Amazon. We sell through Amazon. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, or for people who are hip to that, it's, uh, we're a three P seller, a third party seller versus a one P seller first party where we sell Mm -hmm. to Amazon. And so it's, um, fraught with peril as well. There, Amazon is very, attentive to the buyers, but not to the sellers. Mm -hmm. And so every now and then something, they will spontaneously screw up my listings and uh, make it Mm -hmm. so it's impossible for me to sell. And then it takes me days or weeks of being on the phone 20 hours a day until they fix the problem that they created. So not, and and you don't get access to the data. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's a challenging place to do business, but it's also such a giant marketplace. You can't really avoid it. I mean, you can, but Mm -hmm. it's a giant marketplace. Um, so, so that's that. And, and then I'm going to tell you this one. I mean, talking about horror stories, I spent two hours on the phone this morning with eBay. Mm-hmm. Someone's doing a thing and I want people to know about this. Uh, in fact, I hope people know about this and I want to hear if anyone else has had something like this happen because mm-hmm. I'm tempted to file a class action lawsuit against eBay. Here's mm-hmm. why. There's a guy listing our products on eBay, taking one of, at first it was all of our newest products. We got a call from a customer saying, do you know someone selling your stuff on eBay for half price? And we were going, how could they possibly do that? And so mm-hmm. they, were, they had listed all of our products at half wow. price. What they were doing is selling the product to the buyer, taking the money from the buyer, then coming to our website and placing an order that we were going to ship to the buyer, except that they were using a stolen credit card to place the order on our website. Jeez. So then we got hit with the chargeback from the stolen credit card owner after we'd already shipped the product. And eBay, of course, gets a commission on that transaction. Mm-hmm. And the last conversation I had with eBay, they said, well, you know, we can't, we can't do anything about this because the fact that they use a credit card, stolen credit card on your website has nothing to do with us. I said, well, I want to prosecute these people and you have their contact information. They said, well, we can't give you, give, give you their contact information. I said, so because it's you know, a privacy issue. I said, so you want to protect the privacy of a felon, someone who's engaged in mail fraud and credit card theft, who then called me Um, Mm -hmm. and harassed me by pretending to be an eBay employee, which is another form of fraud. They said, yeah, we can't give out that information. (laughs) I mean, it cost us many, many, many thousands of dollars. Wow. And until we figured it out and found a way to to stop it as best as we could. But it it started again and they're doing it again. And I called eBay again and they, I told them, here's how you find it in the future. So it never happens. And they refused to do it. Um, And they refused it to take down this person's account. They go, well, how do we know that they're creating a problem? I go, I just showed you. So we have to do this crazy thing where I have to file a police report in my town Mm -hmm. and the police have to get on eBay's website and submit that report. And then we have to wait to see if eBay is gonna give us the data that we can use to try to find these guys to then file a uh, lawsuit against them in wherever they live. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, eBay has continued to make money on the fees from the transaction. Wow. That's sort of what I said, but with a few extra syllables um, and a lot louder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's reprehensible. It's really, um, and, and they know that this is happening. This is not mm-hmm. a surprise to them. And yet when you call them to report this, it took me an hour just to get through to someone who understood what I was talking about when I said, they're doing a thing called triangulation fraud. Here's what's happening. And mm-hmm. the first four people that I talked to didn't, couldn't understand it. Wow. So, you, I mean, like pretty much you're facing challenges from all of these sites, right? So you're just like protecting. Yeah. 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 So look, here, when people ask me, you know, look, the business is going well. People, mm-hmm. And people use the word success sometimes. It's not a word yeah. that I use. 
because I can always see what I want to be doing way in the future. But I say um, success, 90% of it is luck. And then the other 10% is luck. And then there's a whole other 100% where 90% of that is working your butt off. And the other 10% is hopefully being smart enough to figure out how to put out the fires that started overnight, even though nothing changed when you were asleep. So um, that's the... My, my wife early on, she was complaining. She says, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. I said, no one knows what they're doing. We're making it all up every day based on what we discover that day. She goes, oh, I can do that. I said, I know. So, you know, that suddenly made it easier. That's, that's interesting perspective. Like, so people see the numbers, right? Like, oh, the company makes so much in revenue, so much in yeah. profit, like, or a company yeah. got, you know, sold or acquired or, you know, exit. Like people see those, right? And it's like, wow, it's, it's you know, uh, and people don't see all the stuff that goes like underneath that. Well, they also don't see all the companies that started the same way, doing the same kind of things, doing it all right, and it just didn't work. So we see the winners. We focus mm -hmm. on the, the people who survived. We look at it in hindsight and try to make up a story about how they survived and the other ones didn't. But in real time, they all looked the same. And then something mm -hmm. you know, worked for one company and not for another for reasons that are probably completely unreproducible. Mm -hmm. So that like fighter mentality that you have, like so... Pretty much you, you 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 have an issue and like you're going with all into to solve it do you think that's like mandatory for every entrepreneur or like it's kind of like you can get away without it no <laughs> no in fact we had a meeting this morning we're, we're trying to integrate a new piece of software and it's causing a bunch of problems and we just had a big team meeting about it and i mm -hmm. said um i can't even tell you how upsetting it is for me to be hearing this because when there's a problem I want to solve it immediately. And if I can't, because I can't do it immediately or I can't do it, um, I find that unbelievably unpleasant in a way that I can't even describe. My wife has learned not to say things like, hey, can you take a look at my computer? If she knows that I don't have an hour or I can't you know, do it immediately mm -hmm. because if she tells me there's a problem, I want to go solve it immediately. And um, if I can't, that's, you know, makes it very stressful. So, um, and, and I, I was, when we asked the question, I was thinking, you know, could you be an entrepreneur who just hires someone like that? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you could. I'm a little iffy about that. You need, let's just say, okay, it's possible, but you definitely need to have somebody in the company, at least one person in the company who, when they see a problem, they just need to put out that fire. When I, what I'm thinking right now is in our company, we have like 10 people like that. So I think the reality is probably that mm -hmm. if you are an entrepreneurial company, not mm -hmm. just a person, then you need, a, that's the attitude that everyone needs to have to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Because you don't want them just coming in to do a job. You want them coming in to make it work. And if there's a problem to be, you know, so on top of it that it gets solved. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's just different kinds of fires at different levels. Very good perspective. Makes it, sound, makes it sound really enticing, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here's, look, here's the thing. I would argue that if you're an, an entrepreneur, there's nothing I'm going to say that would talk you out of whatever your stupid idea is. So um, this is just, you know, it's what we do. And, mm -hmm. and some days it's great and some days it's horrible. And most days you don't get enough sleep and you could use a vacation and a clone and an assistant and a clone of your assistant and assistant for your clone. And, but, you know, what else are you going to do? Get a job? <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Um, so uh, what would be like your, like, one piece of advice to, like, entrepreneurs? Like, for, so, you, I mean, you, you probably see, like, a lot of entrepreneurs. You see companies that done well, companies that didn't do well. Like, what what's kind of, like, the major thing that you see that? <laughs> well, like I love that you asked that because what I, you know, what I said in the last five minutes was that that question has no meaning. So um, um, one of the things that I used to do to people, I, I met a lot of people who were very successful. Uh -huh. and most people asked them, how'd you get to be successful? Uh -huh. What I asked them was, um, if, I, if you dig a little bit, you saw that most of them, you know, their, their personal equity curve did this. They made money, they lost money, they made money, they lost money. <laughs> yeah. And so I asked them, um, if you had to teach a course on how to go broke the way you did, what would uh -huh. you teach? And the, the lessons on how to fail are often better and more reproducible and something you can pay attention to more than the success part. Uh -huh. So things like um, not paying attention to your competition, uh, getting overextended, not paying attention to your numbers, not knowing, you know, are you really making money or not? Not knowing, is there really an audience for your product before you spend a bunch of, bunch of money developing it? 
Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of things that you can do where it's all, it's basically looking at the risk side first, not the reward side first. Mm -hmm. When someone calls me with some sort of advertising idea, um, mm -hmm. and they tell me how much money I'm going to make. I said, I don't care how much money I, you think I'm going to make. How much could I lose? How quickly and cheaply can I find out if you're wrong? Because that's all I can control is knowing how much it's going to cost me if you have your head up your butt. And then mm -hmm. what are you going to do if you have your head up your butt? Are you going to give me my money back? Are you going to keep trying it until it works? I mean, what are you going to do? Because I can only, it's my money. Mm -hmm. And you know, when people say, well, I feel confident it's going to work. I say, I don't really care how you feel. If you were really confident, you'd back it up with a money back guarantee. And since mm -hmm. you're not doing that, you're not really confident. You just think that it's going to work for some reason. But mm -hmm. if you're, you know, other, because if you're really confident, if you were right every time, you wouldn't need to sell me on this. You would just say, let's just try it and I'll prove to you that it works. Mm -hmm. Since you're not doing that, you're not really confident. I've had people say, I'll prove to you that it works. We'll do it for free and you can see. Sometimes mm -hmm. those have worked and sometimes those haven't. So anyway, I guess the short version of the advice is pay attention to the risk um, not the upside. Mm -hmm. And now that definitely, that doesn't, uh, that, that puts a crimp in some things. I mean, there's some marketing things that I could do that I'm pretty confident, um, would work and that I haven't spent the money on because it's a bunch of money. If it doesn't work, it's a bunch of money. What's mm -hmm. been really nice as the business has grown is the amount of money that I'm willing and able to risk has mm -hmm. gone up. So it's still not, huge amount. I mean, there's one company, they think they can really improve um, how much we're making. And they say, it's going to cost me $15,000 a month for three months to prove it. I'm not going to spend that kind of money. That's mm -hmm. $45,000 on a maybe too much for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so even at this level, so even like with revenues, was like, you still have this like attitude, like you, you still like kind of like counting your risks and everything, right? Always. It's the only, it's the only thing you can yeah, but typical, typical thing with company, the bigger it is like, you know, typical, oh, okay. It's like, let's do this, let's do that. You know, like kind of like all, all kind of like expenses. So yes, yeah. we're, we're, right? again, we're, we're just, we're very frugal and what it's allowed us to do is it's allowed us to grow our company and be profitable for like the last five years, uh -huh. which is really unheard of in this industry. Um, and again, there's probably some things that I could have done that may have worked, may have made it grow, grow faster, but I can also imagine that they might not have. So human beings were not very good at thinking of the alternative paths that history might have taken, especially if they don't match up with what we fantasize about. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's, a, why, that's why the, the crisis, like, you know, the-, the yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's exactly what happens. And, and here's the thing. So do you know, um, do you know um, Nassim Taleb who wrote Fooled by Randomness? Do you know this book? No, no. Fooled by randomness. The subtitle is The Hidden Role of, of Chance, Luck and uh -huh. Chance, I think, in Markets and Life. Uh -huh. And um, Nassim Taleb's business was thinking of all the things that could go wrong that uh -huh. people were going to bet weren't going to happen. And then he would bet that they happened. And because um, oh. they're very rare, but when they happen, they're very big. And uh -huh. so he made a lot of money twice on things that people said would never be a problem. And they were big problems. Um, so, yeah, people get very everybody gets very optimistic and they just overlook, you know, like the global pandemic that's probably starting. <laughs> so um, the, the only thing you can really control to a certain extent is the downside. Mm -hmm. Most businesses, they go under because they spent too much money on something that wasn't working. Mm. That's, I mean, that's a very good point. It's like totally opposite, right? Like everyone's like entrepreneurship is like buy like a nice car and like, Ferrari, like Lamborghini, you know. Every, every time I see some internet marketer going, hey, look at my new, my new Lamborghini, I think you're a moron. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, it, it's like, congratulations, but you're a moron because you just don't know. And for every guy who buys the Lamborghini and is able to keep running that business and pay it off and still have a life at the end of it, there's 10 guys who bought that Lamborghini and it got repossessed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying don't try it, but... Mm -hmm. Here, wait, I'll show you my car. Hold on. Let's see if I can do this. So <laughs> hold on. Wait. Okay. There's my, that's my Subaru BRZ. So that's my, that's my cheap Lamborghini. That's, I mean, that's still fast. Oh, it's a beautiful car. I, it, it, I use Uber. <laughs> car makes me so happy every time I'm in it. It's utterly ridiculous. And the one thing I did is um, I put a supercharger in it. So it's, you know, it's fast, it's fun. And it was just not very expensive. 
and mm-hmm. I've driven the more expensive versions of that car, they're, they're not as good. They're heavy. They're not, they're not as nimble. So, you know, you, you can have a whole lot of fun without having a car that's going to get you pulled over every time you take it out of the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's so good conversation. And like, um, thank you for, thank you for sharing this. Um, guys, thank you for, uh, thank, thank you for watching. So-